those of you who didn't get your quiz back from last time, and this is a general thing, I'm only going to hand them back, like make a point out of handing them back once, so if you didn't get yours, see me. Because uh, I do have those, I'll bring those, but I'm not going to generally take the time to go through the handing back process. Okay, we get to talk about glaciers today. We finished up weathering as much as we're ever going to finish up weathering. And now we get to talk about glaciers. I'm this, I'm, in some sense, a lot less mysterious because you can see the dang things. You know, they're not underground. Uh, a lot of rocks aren't underground. You can see weathering too. Um, but some of the same, some similar issues, a lot of what goes on that's in, interesting and important with glaciers goes on up underneath a bunch of ice. And, um, and therefore, we're still presents a challenge, right? And so uh, there's still stuff to learn about glaciers, which is good for science, because we like love learning stuff. So I wanted to start off then with this sort of basic question of what's a glacier? What are the basic ingredients of this particular geomorphic agent. Ice. Ice. Ice and a ring tongue. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Um, what? Now, it's not just any old ice, right? There's got to be some. Uh, I mean, you know, I got ice in my freezer, so that's not a glacier, right? Unless it is. Yeah. And it's also movement of ice, or like. Oh. So, flow of ice. movement of ice, but, um, okay. What is, I guess, um, in order to have movement, uh, well, what do we need? I mean, I'll go ahead and say that, you know, we need to get the ice flows um, sort of under its own weight and some kind of uh, some kind of pressure gradient essentially of, I'll just call it a slope what else? we see some hands up yeah uh, it's perennial it's perennial so it we need um, If it moves under its own weight, it's perennial. That means, you know, let me kind of cut to, uh, we need a, a certain mass of ice. Um, so we need snow, because it's going to come from snow. We need more snow than melt for some Time, and you said perennial, which essentially means years, right? So from year to year. So essentially over some time, we've got more snow than melt somewhere. And I'm going to put that up here. So we've got the issue of space and time, yeah. So I'm going to wait to write that up, but that that brings us to the important issue of this space, right? That that we've got more snow than melt, but we don't live in snowball or neoproterozoic time, right? You know, it's not you know we don't have continental ice sheets that are ever getting ever larger year after year and encompassing the Earth. Um, I guess unless we did, uh, but there is some, you know, when I say somewhere, that means, you know, there is some spatial aspect to it. There is, at some point, um, a place where melt exceeds the snow. And so let's start to kind of put some diagrams and graphs up on the board to picture what, what we're talking about. 
because it gets a little bit difficult to talk about just in words without putting some, uh, some pictures to it. So I'm going to start with just um, see if I can stack these reasonably well. Let's start with we'll have distance. You know, somewhere we've got snow greater than melt. So let's on this axis we'll we'll graph both the snow and the melt per year. Okay? And so at some point then we've got I'll put snow up here and a dashed line below that for melt. And so that implies if, if we've got some snow greater than melt, let's draw some other graphs that represent sort of the amount of ice we've got. Um, well, I can draw a Let's, for simplicity's sake, because I want to draw something that makes some intuitive sense, I'm going to put flux up here. And so flux versus distance. But I'm going to kind of hold in my, I'm going to assume, um, just for the sake of drawing it, that we've got uniform ice velocity. Now we talked about ice movement, and obviously we need to deal with movement. Today I just kind of want to cover the mass balance part of it. We'll deal with movement like next time, and then what happens as a result of that movement, i.e. erosion on Friday. But um, so to simplify the whole movement issue, I'm going to assume just for drawing purposes, at least to start with, that I've got a uniform ice velocity. And that means that I can draw something that looks like an ice thickness here where I'm drawing in the flux. So um, if I've got some bit here, and the way I've drawn it, at least to start off, um, I've got kind of a constant amount of snow with distance, a constant amount of melt with distance. So at least to start with, uh, I'd have a linear increase in the flux. Down here, I'm going to draw in again versus distance x. It's getting shorter to write that. I'm going to uh, have the balance down here, which is the snow minus the melt. And I need to practice getting this right, dang it, because actually for this one it's helpful to sort of draw arrows going both ways, to have a negative mass balance down there, positive mass balance up here, and um, zero in the middle. Let me rewrite that so that's not so crowded, sorry about that. So zero mass balance there. Okay, so that is if I've got uh, snow more than melt, then I'm in the positive zone here, and I'll try to draw it uh, about similar magnitude and try to line up these axes more or less. So um, now, as I go along here, uh, you know, kind of gave away a bit one of the punchlines at the at the beginning here, we're going to have what's known as an ELA. What's that mean? Well, at some point, um, let's say with distance, we are getting to places where there is either more melt or less snow or both. So just for the sake of some generality, um, I'll draw the melt line increasing and, and the snow line decreasing. Let me see if I can 
not make these so radical that it can actually take up some space here. Okay, and, and eventually these lines cross. Okay, so right away I know I can go ahead, the easiest thing probably now is to is to put in my balance line, at least put in a point here at zero. All right, snow and melt are equal, so snow minus melt is zero. Um, I started off with this linearly increasing flux, but now I've got this uh, decreasing distance between my snow and melt lines. So my the rate at which I increase my flux with distance is going to start rolling up. That is, this flux line is going to start, uh, the slope of it's going to get smaller until I get to this point where the two lines are equal. And that's where it maxes out and flattens out. That is, that line is, <coughs> the tangent to that line is now horizontal. Yeah. Well, so yeah, here we've got the melt increasing, the snow decreasing, the flux down here is going up as we've still got a positive difference between snow and melt, that is my balance through here is still positive until it's not, until it reaches zero. You mean the flux graph, the first dashed line here? That's not the flux graph. Oh, this, this dashed line. That line. Oh, I was just drawing a line to say, uh, so that to help me line up these different graphs. And I started off drawing these these lines pretty much horizontal up here. So that's kind of where I, that's, that was, again, just sort of a guide for my drawing. Um, OK. Now, if we follow this trend, more or less, then we know that, then say, you know, melt keeps increasing. We still have snow. It's not that there is no snow. I mean, obviously, if we've got some melt, then we must have some snow. But um, we'll draw this snow going down um, and try to, try to draw it similarly so that the two sort of level off just for the sake of drawing. Um, and again, I can go down to my mass balance. Um, now I've got you know, a similar sort of magnitude of the balance that I started with, except now it's negative. So if I go down here, um, you have a point down here, and that balance line is going to do something like that. Um, that means, well, if I'm, if I'm subtracting in the net here, then that must mean that my flux is decreasing as I go down distance. And eventually, well, why did I draw an end to this line? Well, at some point, my flux must reach zero. I mean, again, unless we're on snowball earth and the whole earth is, you know, the glacier ends somewhere. Whether this is a continental ice sheet and we're going north to south, or it's a mountain glacier and we're coming down in elevation, at some point we, we reach the terminus of that glacier. And so the end of the ice. Now, it's a little odd. It, it, I, I drew it partly this way just because it's easier to draw it flat initially and to go ahead and say, well, this is flux, this isn't necessarily ice height, but I'm going to draw it sort of like it's ice height. Um, let me down here then put. Uh, Again, a graph versus distance. But now on this axis, I've got elevation. And so I'm going to just draw in some fake topography, something like that. This is supposed to be rock.
aka Dwayne Johnson. And, and if I draw my ice on here, you know, here's where I get to my, oh, uh, this, I'm, I'm going to draw this uniform velocity so that this kind of makes sense to draw as a thickness. So, uh, let's see, let me kind of trace down here. That means that, well, at this point, I know I've got zero ice thickness. Also, uh, I've drawn it so that down here I've got zero ice thickness. That is, if I'm drawing in points for my ice surface, I know there's zero thickness here, zero thickness here. That is, the ice elevation equals the surface elevation. And in the middle, I've got you know, something like a point there. And so, if I just kind of, you know, I don't know. That's, for what it's worth, my crude ice rendering. And here, of course, we've got our icy geomorphication. rock down here and ice up here. Okay. Um, one thing that I can do and that's often done and this gets to uh, this issue of this thing that we call an equilibrium line altitude. Let me Still not digging this uh, this line I've drawn too much. Okay. All right, whatever. Um, I'm going to draw another graph over here. Um, let me draw the. Uh, so I'm getting too close to the bottom there. I'll draw it up here. Um, Instead of distance on my x-axis now that I'm drawing it over here, um, I want my mass balance. So positive and negative mass balance. So it should look something like this graph, except now I'm plotting it um, versus elevation. So my elevation axis here. Um, and so I know that here I've got positive mass balance. Here it's zero. Trying to try to get these in the right places. And then down here it's negative. So I've got a graph that looks something like that. Okay, so again, this let me draw this, write that axis label in a bit larger. Okay, so same balance axis here. Um, now, now I can get to finally write down what you gave me, uh, which was something called the equilibrium line altitude. So this here, So this is my so-called ELA, and before I let you choke on, on writing up an acronym, uh, let's just talk specifically what about the different zones, the different parts of this glacier. I've got a place where the balance is greater than zero, I've got a place where the balance is less than zero and a point where the balance equals zero, right? So where the balance is greater than zero, and this is essentially terminology at this point, um, but this is the so-called accumulation zone.
where my balance is negative, losing mass, we call that ablation. So I'm going to call, call that the ablation zone. Why don't I just call it the melt zone? Well, because I kind of, in a sense, cheated by or oversimplified, shall we say, by saying that I have just snow versus melt. Because I can get rid of snow by means other than just melting it, right? Uh, what's the other thing that I, if I were being super accurate, that I should have added here to melt? A little sublimate, right? Sublimation, yeah. That is where the, the ice goes directly to water vapor instead of going to liquid water between the two. So, um, and we call that process of melt and sublimation, we give it the catch-all term of ablation. Yeah. Could you throw like avalanche and wind drift into that too, or does it have to In be? In terms of like the snow part? Yeah, because you can sure. basically lose snow on a glacier through wind or something. Well, so you can lose it via wind, but um, and avalanching, but avalanching, you're more likely to be gaining it, you know, because it, say I've, you know, if I drew the rest of this topography, what's it likely to look like? At least up here, it's going to be something like a cirque, maybe, and whatever snow falls on those steep slopes around the head of the glacier is likely as not to fall onto the head of the glacier. So, uh, so yeah. In addition to snow, um, I could have other. Let me just put other mass gains. where we could be talking snow avalanching. What was the other one? You said? Wind. Right, yeah, wind, wind drift, um, which could could do both, go both ways. I mean, uh, um, you know, we might imagine that uh, in some cases, maybe we've got a wind that's, that's coming up the slope and it might carry some snow up to the accumulation zone. In other cases, we might have a uh, downslope wind. Um, uh, different times of the day or, or year, we might have be more likely to have one or the other. Um, but yeah. All right. Oh, yeah. In the middle, then, um, here is where we are at equilibrium. And at least in the case where we're talking about mountain glaciers, uh, we call this the equilibrium line altitude. Or ELA for short. Now, I, if we have, if we were talking continental ice sheets, that wouldn't be such a. We probably wouldn't want to stick altitude on that. We might have an equilibrium line latitude, I suppose. But I don't know, I'm not sure I've heard people talk about ELL. But, um, okay. Even you know, I suppose even with continental ice sheets, say. Um, you know, we are typically talking like, you know, the whole surface is something like a dome, so even there, we can probably draw an altitude on that equilibrium line. It's harder to draw it, uh, but drawing of it, perhaps. Okay. Um, mm -hmm. Okay. I want to be clear about some flow directions here. I said this is my flux. 
Um, and let's just, I guess, sort of pretend at least for the moment that when we're talking about accumulation, let's just talk about we've got the snow and let's leave off the avalanches and, and the wind for now. Um, just cuz. Uh, well, why cuz? <laughs> um, so let's let's think about ice that falls as snow here. And in general it's going to be moving down slope. So we know that it, at least it has perhaps the dominant um, component of its of its velocity vector or its flux vector at this point would be pointing uh, to distance, to greater distance. Um, but does it stay at the surface? So if I'm in the accumulation zone and I'm moving along this way, um, does this ice stay at the surface? I saw you shaking your head back there. I said, no, why not? It's going to get buried by more snow. Back um, in the 70s, there was a soccer team that crashed in the Andes. They didn't find the plane for decades. They eventually found it pop out the bottom of the glacier. It got buried because they crashed in the accumulation zone. So this ice gets buried, which means that in addition to a component of velocity going to greater distance, I've also got, and I know this is supposed to be a flux line, not a space line, but just for the let me sort of draw some component of the velocity vector that's going downward or at least in deeper into the ice so that my net uh, velocity vector would look something like that. And if I draw it on my actual, so-called actual ice here, um, I may need to exaggerate a little bit, but my velocity vector is pointed away, is down, is going to greater distance, but it's it's also not parallel to the ice. It's tilted down relative to the ice surface. Uh, what about then, say at some point down here? Let's talk about some ice that starts below the surface in the ablation zone. Does it stay at that depth? No, it, it gets closer to the surface and eventually it must reach the surface, at least if the melting is, is happening from the top down, which it does. So here again, I'm going to have some component of my velocity going to greater distance, but I'm also going to have a component of the velocity going up relative to the surface of the ice so that my resultant vector is tilted with respect to the ice surface. And if I draw that down here, then I've got my ice apparently moving towards the surface. Again, it doesn't, you know, it's, it's maybe somewhat misleading to think of the ice as moving towards the surface, it's just that there's less surface above it as it goes along. So in effect, it's moving towards the surface, you know, but that's just in terms of our frame of reference. What's happening then here in the middle at the equilibrium line altitude? Now, one of the things that we should note is that my flux is maximum here. And you know, it, it, it is perhaps a little bit counterintuitive, but maybe not either, because you know, where, 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 where accumulation equals ablation, um, everywhere up ice of that, I've been adding ice as I go, and so my flux is maxing out at that ELA and then declining from there. Yeah? So that So at that point, yeah, it's pretty much, if I, if I just tag a bit of ice in here, um, it is moving parallel to the surface. There is no 
component of its velocity vector that's either going up or down relative to the surface. Now, of course, just up ice of that, just down up ice of that is a different story, but at that particular point, my vector is parallel to the ice surface. Let's see if I can draw that reasonably down here. Okay. So I've got the greatest flux. It's moving parallel to the surface, perhaps also parallel to the bed. Uh, ice is diving up here, ice is surfacing down here. Again, it's all, you know, using terms that, that might make it somewhat intuitive to think what's going on, but we do need to remember it's just about our frame of reference with respect to the ice surface. Okay. Um, so I've drawn this as um, a glacier on a mountain. Um, but all glaciers have, have the things in common that we started with. That is, um, ice flows, well, we've got some movement and we've got some mass. So in general, glaciers move from where the mass balance is positive towards where the mass balance is negative. If we want to think about an ice sheet, um, you know, in general we'd be starting at a, at a dome and our, uh, our ice flux would actually go to zero there, but our ice thickness would probably have to be a maximum, you know, say in the middle of Greenland. Okay. It's a little more intuitive to deal with the mountain glacier at least for me, but again, um, all glaciers have this thing in common. They're going to move from where the mass balance is positive towards where it's negative. Um, now, if our if our place where it's uh, positive is just near the top of a mountain, and we get our relatively well-contained glacier. Um, again, where that someplace is a large part of the continent or other land mass, we can get a nice sheet that is on Greenland or Antarctica or, you know, uh, the continental ice sheets of Europe and North America back at the last glacial maximum. Now, let's, let's again, you know, what gets us a positive mass balance is simply that our, our snow mass per year is greater than our melt and sublimation mass per year. Um, so let's just write that. We know that for a glacier, we know that um, you know, snow greater than melt um, somewhere again. Um, in terms of the snow part, what do we need for snow? Well, we need some precipitable water at a cold enough temperature that it falls as snow. Okay, so that's precipitation. plus cold enough. And for melt, we need warm enough <coughs> but one of the things that we can, that we might recognize is that you know snow and melt you know in order to get a snow greater than melt we can we've got at least a couple of knobs we can turn right because we can turn up you know in order to get a positive mass balance we can turn up the snow um, but we can also turn down the melt so for example um, well that actually leads us to uh, 
a particular way to classify glaciers according to the whether we're more whether whether the knob that we're cranking on the snow part is more about cranking up the precipitation or is it more about cranking up the cold um, so So if we, if we crank up the coal, then that gives us a polar glacier. And a polar glacier is where it's, you know, we cranked up the coal, we put in parentheses, um, not much precipitation. Antarctica is, after all, a desert. On the other end of things, if we crank up the snow, but say it's you know not all that cold. then we call that a temperate glacier. And these are going to have very different, uh, you good with me getting rid of this bit here. These are going to have different sort of sorts of temperature profiles. Different, and, and therefore different um, Different sorts of ice, really. Okay, what am I what am I talking about? Um, my polar glacier. Let's draw. Uh, got some ice up here. Here, let's see. We've got the ground. And up here, I've got air. And I'm going to stick a graph on here of temperature versus temperature versus uh, elevation here. So in a polar glacier, this is my freezing point. I in general have temperatures that are far below zero but and, and decreasing as I go up. Down here is my geothermal gradient. Of about um, 25 degrees C per kilometer. And up here, it's going to be more like 20 degrees C per kilometer. The main issue being, if my freezing point is here, all of the ice, pretty much almost all the time, is way below freezing. Or way below, let me be uh, maybe a little clearer, way below the so-called pressure melting point. Why do I bring pressure into it? You need to bring in pressure to talk about the temperate, like, temperate ice condition. So draw this over here. Again, it's got air. Ice, ground down here, and I'll draw up again my elevation or <coughs> temperature and zero here. 
in the middle. All right, that's way down there. All right. Um, okay, at the top, at least for a decent part of the year, uh, my ice temperature is going to be right at the freezing point. In order to understand how to draw it below that, I need to draw another graph too. Over here, let me draw uh, a phase diagram for ice or water. I mean. On this axis, I've got pressure. On this axis, I've got temperature. And here I've got one atmosphere. Here I've got zero degrees C. Uh, the so-called pressure melting point of ice at one atmosphere is zero degrees C. It's literally how the Celsius scale is defined. And what happens then as I increase temperature above one atmosphere? What happens to the to the melting point in terms of temperature? The drop. So the uh, this has a slope towards that. So on this side I've got ice, and on this side of, let me just be specific: solid, liquid. And let's draw it on down that way. I'm not really intending there to be a significant or meaningful change in slope there, just in general trying to draw a negatively sloped line here. Okay, so this is one of the things that makes ice a bit special. You can skate on it, you can ski on it, because if I if my ice is right near the freezing point at one atmosphere, if I put a little pressure on it, I get a little melt. If I put a lot of pressure on it, I get more melt. And so one way to put a lot of local pressure is to put all my weight on a, onto a blade. If I do that, then I can melt that ice beneath the blade, and now I can scoot across a little layer of water and be nearly friction. That's why ice is slippery if it's not too cold. If ice is way, way cold, then your tongue's freezes to the flagpole, right? Uh, it's not exactly slippery if it's really, really cold. Um, so that means over here, in terms of my uh, pro temperature profile in my ice, if I'm at zero degrees C in the air, my pressure in the air is one atmosphere. That means below that point, I've got more and more ice above my head, uh, more and more pressure, and so the and as it turns out, the ice temperature drops like so. Uh, down here, I have the same um, geothermal gradient as I had before. And you know, maybe I, conceivably I could be exaggerating a little bit. You know, we're we're not talking big changes in temperature. Um, that 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 line is very steep. Um, in order to even see the slope of that line on the phase diagram, um, you know, we've got to kind of zoom in on that part of it, stretch out the uh, stretch things because that line is steep. Um, but what this means is this is essentially that the ice temperature is very near the so-called PMP. This is, this line represents the pressure melting point. Or PMP. Okay, 
So again, if the top of the glacier is right at about zero, um, I get down here, pressure is greater than one atmosphere, and so the, temp the freezing point is lower than zero. If it's still ice, then the temperature drops below zero degrees C. Um, now, how does this actually happen? I mean, it's off. It it, it kind of has to, or or if it doesn't, we wouldn't have a glacier, right? I mean, if if the if the temperature here didn't go down, didn't drop a bit with depth, then it wouldn't be ice anymore. Would it? But what's the actual mechanism that gets me there? I mean, I've got to somehow, I've got to have some mechanism for sort of communicating temperature, in effect, or transferring heat upward and downward, at least downward through the glacier. Um, so what that means is that, so how does it happen? Well, I've got melt at the top. And I've got porous ice. And for the top bit, it's snow or fern. And that fern, I guess, being defined as snow that's lasted at least a year. Or sort of corny snow. Uh, that's a good word. So uh, melt means that I've got liquid water. And it's cold at the top. The liquid water, um, well, it's, I'm sorry. So liquid water plus, as it moves down through the porous ice, all right, this one. So melt at the top of porous ice equals uh, downward Downward water movement. Yeah. Specifically below the ELA? Uh, not necessarily, but we are probably. I mean, it's easier for me to think of this actually in the accumulation zone, just because there's snow up there. Um, in, and I've only been to a glacier in the summer, and below the ELA, we tend to have bare ice in the summer. That doesn't, I mean, it does, it, but it can happen throughout the glacier. Um, you know, the point is simply, and I, you know, at least in this in the summertime, we've got some melt at the top, and we've got the porous ice, and draining water going down through the glacier. So if we have, as that water goes down, we've got some liquid water plus colder ice, then that's going to give us more ice plus heat. So why do I put heat? Phase change, right? So in order to get, in order to melt the ice, I need to add heat, not just have the temperature be, you know, I have to actually supply heat. There's a, there's a latent heat of that phase change. So as it melts, I mean, as it freezes, I get back that heat. Um, And so even if my ice were colder down here, adding that heat is going to push it towards that pressure melting point. And that's you know, essentially going to communicate uh, the temperature at the surface throughout the column of ice. Whereas, you know, because the water moves, I, I don't have to wait for uh, heat to diffuse through as if, you know, through a bar of steel because I'm actually oozing. I've actually got water 
carrying that feet along. Um, in the last minute, then, I will just leave you with um, some pretty pictures. This is a nice surface reconstruction for the Cascades. Um, and here's the crest. And you can see the difference. So here's the ELA on this side, ELA on that side. You see the difference in the amount of snow. Um, we get a lot more snow on the west side of the Cascades than the east side. The difference in the mass balance producing different ELAs, different amounts of ice. We can see that also um, in Alaska and Wrangell St. Elias, uh, Bagley Ice Field, moist ocean air coming north, um, and then just fiddly little glaciers uh, and a dry valley. Not dry valley, there is a creek going through it, but an ice free valley there on the snow shadow side of this divide. Yeah. Um, here's one of the glaciers in that on that north side of the divide on the snow shadow side. In the summer, you can see the, the snowy accumulation zone even in the summer, uh, the bare ice in the ablation zone in the summer. Um, and here's actually me on that ice. That's me for scale. You can see the, the bare ice. Um, and I got, I'll just leave it at that. I've got some other pretty pictures, but and I'll make sure. Make your point to stay. But you're not required to stay at this point. Make sure you've got. I've got your quizzes before you leave, and you didn't get those too. Uh, this is a. This is another glacier. The one I was showing you before is a little place down the valley there. This is further up the valley. Um, you mentioned snow avalanches. We've also got rock avalanches that transports that rock down the ice that way. Uh, wonderful moraine, um, the lateral ones, of course, being a lot clearer. Uh, this is looking north from that divide. Um, so, you know, climbing up, when we get to the top, we look over and we see that ice planet. <laughs> um, that's the back of the ice field. It's kind of amazing. Um, go back to the air photo. So again, I'd be standing up on one of these divides looking that way. Um, and that ice pours out down here. And this one of the, the reason we were here is this is a particularly interesting spot. As, as, we, as we get more snow, less melt, this glacier advances, dams up the end of this valley and forms a lake here. Um, and then when the ice retreats, uh, the lake busts out the dam and drains it. Um, and so you can see the former lake bed down here and some stacks of sediment that are being taken out. Um, and you find, of course, glacial erratics all over that surface down there because of these glaciers that come out and then float out as icebergs when there's water in there. Um, here's, uh, I forget, this glacier is kind of famous just because it's so perfect looking. Um, but it's kind of interesting because you can see these medial moraines, but you can also see the cracks and it's a very, actually very thin layer of, of stuff on top of that ice. Um, it's just that it insulates the ice so that it stays high and gives the illusion of a pile of material. Um, but really it's a pile of ice. Um, of course, here's a, uh, terminus and downstream of the terminus of the glacier where we source rivers and um, with very high sediment fluxes and um, pretty cool those things. Uh, Antarctica, so anyway. The glaciers I have known. Um, so Wednesday we will talk about uh, how the ice moves. Friday we'll talk about what it does when it does that. See you then.